Shondell Jackson, real life villain. On April 17th, 2010, everyone in the courtroom waited with bated breaths as Judge Rebecca Dallet took her seat. There were no questions about the verdict. The defendant was undoubtedly guilty of first degree murder. But given the peculiar circumstances of the case, the crowd waited patiently for the judge's sentence, some wishing for mercy, others praying for justice, and all in a state of hopeful anxiety. With half of the courtroom white and the other black, State v. Shondell Jackson would become one of the most sensational cases in Wisconsin, sparking debates on race, family, and sentences. And it all started with a single shot. Our story begins with Nathan Potter a year earlier in 2009. He was a student at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and, by all accounts, was a sweet and likable person. When 21-year-old Nathan wasn't in school studying filmmaking, he spent his holidays at home with his parents, Denise and John Potter, and his younger siblings, 13-year-old Sarah and 11-year-old David, who both adored their older brother. The Potters were a well-off family, and Nathan lived comfortably in his River West apartment, just one mile from campus. Perhaps it was the annoyance that someone with much more affluence than him, claiming to have no money, sparked Nathan's murderer to commit such a grievous act. On July 6, 2009, Nathan Potter made his way home on what seemed like a usual Monday night. Although it was relatively late at 1 a.m., Nathan had made this trip several times and probably thought nothing of it. If only he had been aware of another shooting that had taken place blocks away from where he was, he might have chosen an alternate route. Suddenly, on the corner of North Dousman, two men jumped him and one pulled out a gun. The pair made threats pushing Nathan around and demanding money. Unfortunately, besides his unfortunate route, Nathan had made the unfaithful decision to go out without cash. Angered by the fact they had wasted their time and perhaps worried that Nathan could identify them, the man with the gun shot Nathan and killed him. Unremorseful, shocked, or terrified of the law, the perpetrators fled the scene on foot. Shortly before the gunshot, a neighborhood resident had called to the police to report suspicious activity in the area. Seeing as there was a robbery the night before, it's not surprising that the resident was anxious. Unfortunately, their call couldn't save Nathan, and when police discovered his body, they were horrified at the execution of such a young man. They quickly swept the scene, looking for clues that would lead them to the killer. They also dug into Nathan's past, wondering if his previous misdemeanor from two years ago might be related to his death. After all, the 21-year-old had a prior conviction for marijuana possession, and he might have mixed up with the wrong crowd. However, soon enough, they would realize that angle was a dead end. During their investigation, detectives could match shell casings they recovered from the scene to that of another crime, a non-fatal shooting from 12 hours earlier. Knowing that both crimes were connected, and through eyewitness accounts from the previous location, investigators could piece together a timeline that would lead to the arrest of Shondell Jackson and Derek Thomas, one of which was already on a getaway bus bound for Mississippi. 19-year-old Shondell Jackson had grown up with his mother, Richetta Jackson, and had a rough childhood, raised by a parent who had to work several hours a day to get by. Although he had plenty of relatives around, he'd never known his biological father, which left a mark on him. According to his family members, he did have a mentor growing up, but the man had died early on in Shondell's life, another victim of murder in a rough neighborhood. Knowing nothing but poverty, it's no surprise Shondell turned to a life of crime early on. Before his unfortunate encounter with Nathan Potter, Shondell was already speeding down the path to self-destruction. He was a bit of a nuisance to the Milwaukee community with three arrests that year. His first known conviction was in January 2009 after the police arrested him for resisting and obstructing an officer. Shondell served 34 days in a county prison for his misdemeanor and was released a month later. Shortly after, in May of the same year, 60 miles away in Sheboygan County, he served another three days in jail for carrying a concealed weapon. Like a Dominion, Shondell would level up with his crimes a mere week before the murder of Nathan when he shot a man on North Holton Street. 
Although the victim survived, Shondell fled the scene at risk of facing 10 years imprisonment on account of reckless safety endangerment, barely escaping attempted murder charges as eyewitnesses attested to seeing the victim quarreling with a woman. Finally, reached the climax of his ever-evolving troubles during the attempted robbery and murder of Nathan Potter. With sufficient evidence from the scene of the crime, police swarmed to the home of their suspect, D, on July 7, 2009. They discovered that D was an alias for Derek Thomas, Shondell's partner in crime, and took him into custody while under arrest and perhaps driven by guilt, Derek decided to come clean. 20-year-old Derek admitted that on July 5th, Shondell had procured a 45 caliber handgun and suggested they rob people for fun. They'd stayed out late and locked onto Nathan as a possible target in the early hours of July 6. They followed him some distance, and with Derek as lookout, Shondell accosted him, demanding money. When Nathan couldn't comply, Shondell shot him in retaliation, and both men fled the scene. Derek confessed that they'd sought shelter at his home on North Pierce Street and played video games till late in the morning. By then, Nathan's face was all over the news, with police asking anyone with information on the case to come forward. While Derek Thomas stayed put, eventually being caught 24 hours later by the cop, Shondell fled yet again. It would take months of searching for police to finally catch up with Shondell, thanks to a tip-off from one of the last people anyone expected to come clean. With Derek in custody and his face splashed all over the news, Shondell Jackson knew he had to leave Milwaukee to escape the law. Through the help of some family members, the then 18-year-old was able to travel to Mississippi incognito on a bus. He was able to lay low with some relatives there for more than two months while the search for him continued. Seventy days after pulling the fatal trigger that ended Nathan's life, police arrested Shondell in Gulfport, Mississippi. Later, his family and the public would be shocked to discover that Jackson's uncle had turned him into the police. After Shondell's sentencing, his uncle, Gerald Hawkins, would go on to tell reporters that he doesn't regret his actions. At the risk of turning his family against him, and even with death threats from beloved relatives, Gerald would stand his ground, insisting that if something like what the Potters were undoubtedly experiencing happened to his children, he'd want anyone with information to come clean. Finally, in police custody and held without bond, Shondell Jackson went to trial for his crimes in February 2010. With the families of the defendant and the victim present, emotions were high in court. The testimony of the Potter family undoubtedly moved the jury. John, Nathan's father, appealed to the judge and the court to exact justice and ensure that Shondell does not have the opportunity to hurt another family. Is there such a thing as pure evil? We think so, he said. Even Nathan's younger sister, Sarah Potter, had the opportunity to speak her mind expressing her sadness and confusion over the loss of her loving big brother. Her confession that it was hard to sleep at night knowing Nathan was gone would have brought tears to some eyes. Despite such moving testimonies, Shondell Jackson was anything but contrite for his crimes. Without remorse, Shondell consistently gestured toward the Potter family with arrogant smirks, cursing at them several times. Even after his conviction, news cameras caught the 19-year-old smiling at the bereaved family. Still, Richetta Jackson made her attempt to save Shondell, pleading with the court that while she had sympathy for the victim's family, her son was not a monster. The prosecution, headed by Mark S. Williams, had a strong case. The police had physical evidence from the gun and shell casings, and Derek, an eyewitness, had confessed. Shondell was facing the maximum sentence for first-degree murder, but his family hoped that considering his young age, the judge would leave open the possibility of parole. Before his conviction, Shondell also made a passionate appeal to the court, apologizing for his previous behavior and begging the judge and jury not to take his life away from him. After convening for a single hour, the jury returned with their verdict, guilty on the charge of first-degree murder. Having heard all sides and considering the jury's verdict, the court returned two months later in April 2010 to hear Judge Rebecca Dallet's ruling. To no one's great surprise, she sentenced Shondell Jackson to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Undoubtedly, Shondell's lack of remorse during his trial weighed heavily on the judge's decision to condemn him to life behind bars. Distraught at his sentence, Shondell abruptly tried to speak over the judge 
and got to his feet in a flurry. It took three guards to restrain him with pepper spray, dragging him to the floor as they did so. While one family member pleaded with him to calm down, another relative in an emotional outburst even yelled, I hate y'all, at the victim's family. Gerald Hawkins, the uncle that turned Shondell in, described his sentence as fair. For his part in Nathan Potter's murder, 20-year-old Derek Thomas pleaded guilty to acting as a lookout and was convicted of felony murder and given a sentence of 12 years behind bars. However, the victim's mother, Denise Potter, would argue against the court's leniency, saying that Derek deserved the maximum punishment of 35 years. Shondell Jackson's case continues to be a reference for racial inequality in America, with many people arguing that black people like Shondell are disproportionately more likely to receive harsher sentences for the same crimes than committed by white felons. Besides the racial aspect, Shondell's case has also been a point for people to argue against life without parole sentences for teenagers with hashtag free Shondell. Whatever side of the argument you side with, it's hard to dispute that the life of Nathan Potter was unjustly cut short and that Shondell Jackson certainly deserved to be put away. So there you have it. Do you think Derek Thomas should have received a harsher sentence? Do you think he should have received the maximum sentence since he was an accomplice to murder? Let us know in the comments below. If you appreciated this video, make sure to like and subscribe for more true crime coverage. Thanks for watching and see you soon in the next video.